Hello and welcome to Pointy End. Uh, Keith Sutherland's still away and I'm filling in. Joined this morning by Margot Rourke. Welcome, Marg. Good morning, Dennis. Now, you're well known uh, to many Bendigonians, Marg, uh, from your days as Telstra General Manager countrywide. What's been happening to Margot Rourke since you left uh, Telstra? Well, Dennis, um, there's always life after Telstra, as many people will tell you. I started my own consultancy business not long after I left Telstra. And I also uh, have been doing some directorships on, uh, on boards. I know you've been involved with the Aspire Foundation as well. Uh, so that community flavour has tended to you know, be very strong running in your veins, I guess. Is that what led you to put your hand up as you've done to nominate for council? Look, it certainly has. Um, even whilst in Telstra, I think that was a, a really good um, a grounding for being involved in the community, certainly as the company was in those days. Um, with the Aspire project and other projects that I've been involved with, it has a very strong commitment to community. Um, and, and it's helped me make that decision about going for local government. Uh, also being a part of the independent review certainly uh, gave me a real insight as well. And I've also worked with councils all over Australia because of the roles that I've done with um, Telstra. You have a lot of work with councils in various areas. So. It's a close up look as a, mm. as a client almost, or business client, to see how they operate. That's right. It's probably a good thing. Um, it's intriguing me though, Marg, you're a mum, you've got your own business, you've got a couple of kids, um, you've got the most loyal husband, I know he's going to be in that corner punching all the way for you. Um, but with all that on your plate, what that would, there would have to be key things that you think need to be done that are not being done uh, for Bendigo at a local government level. Would you care to hit us with one or two of the key things that have made you say, hey, out of my comfort zone, this is going to be tough, but I'm going to have a crack? Look, there are, um, Dennis, some things that really are front of mind for me. One of those is about connecting Bendigo to the world. And you and I have both uh, worked in this space for some time, and that's about connecting on a range of levels, whether it be connectivity in terms of the digital access for people, uh, you know, in terms of infrastructure as well, connecting uh, Bendigo in that space, but it's making sure that we take all the opportunities to partner and open up Bendigo's opportunities to the world. With that, well, you can't talk connecting Bendigo to the world without looking briefly at the NBN, and I know you've had a role in that locally as well, uh, albeit you know, unsuccessfully to some extent. And we've had, as recently as last week, Senator Bridget McKenzie sitting where you are now, and I hit her with the fact that you know, here Bendigo was left behind in the NBN stakes by Ballarat and by Shepparton. And uh, look, we're all in the same boat, these regional cities, increasingly great quality families producing great kids, schooling them, uh, running them through their sports in all the various areas of life in a great community, only to see them take their, their skill sets off to Melbourne for work when they reach employment age in these regional areas, particularly in a place like Shepparton. So I'm not having a shot at Shepparton and Ballarat, but I am saying that they've caught Bendigo short uh, in terms of NBN. How big a, an issue is that going to be around this connecting to Bendigo to the globe? Look, it is an issue and, um, you know, the NBN is rolling out now. We know that through the fixed wireless uh, sites that are rolling out, but also fibre is now rolling out in Bendigo, which is great. Back in 2012, there were some commitments. Um, Bendigo and our region actually got the largest announcement of uh, a fibre rollout for Australia at that time. Unfortunately, it became political. An election was called and contracts weren't signed. So we went back into the mix. Timing is everything. Timing is everything. And so Ballarat, Shepherd and Marutna, a lot of those communities have got fibre where we haven't. And it is really critical. Uh, I've worked at the Regional Expo in Melbourne. Um, you'd be familiar with those that the state government have done for a number of years. And I've worked for a few of the councils at those where they're attracting people to come out of the city and live in a more rural and uh, environment. The top two questions, Dennis, was what's the level of connectivity? Because it is so important to people now for business, for education, for health. It is a strong platform that we have to have a good level of connectivity. It is starting to happen here now, but we are behind. Uh, and where it's been driven really well is when there's a partnership with council. And so that's where I feel there, I've yeah. got a real um, balance there to be able to collaborate more with the telcos. We can't do it on our own. Uh, we need NBN Co and we need the telcos. And I see the city having a, a collaborative role in that. You know, um, we talk about the smart city and, and people have been uh, seeing that in the news in recent times. And the word smart city probably doesn't mean a lot to people. But what it means is uh, being able to be connected and making uh, residents and citizens' lives more um, 
easier and accessible by using connectivity. You know, the Wi-Fi is now connected in the CBD of Bendigo. Um, that enables people to do a whole heap of things and they probably don't realise because it's just their day to day. Mm. Making sure that we have that connectivity for people is important. It's, look, it's scary in a way because I look after local clients in a TV marketing sense and they still make ads and as you know, um, and increasingly a lot of uh, retail, and we do some out of Melbourne as well, but they're facing the reality that where they used to be dealing with passing trade or you know uh, regular clientele locally, it's a global market and people are walking in and they're looking at shoes or a dress or whatever, yeah. and they're buying it online, but they're comparing it and getting the sizes and all that. So we are very much in a global market. When you talk, you've, I know you've talked about job growth for Bendigo as well. Where would you see that coming from when we have a, a local retail sector, if you like, that is really under threat from online? So it almost feeds back into the connectivity thing. It's a vicious circle in a way, mm. but you talk about jobs growth for Bendigo. As a councillor, what would you look to try and... Are there key things there that you think you could do to, uh, to strengthen our case there? Look, um, certainly, Dennis, in terms of jobs and growth, it's around the economic development unit that sits in council, sits in all councils, and uh, ensuring that uh, they're supported to be able to work with business uh, to develop more opportunities. It's about encouraging businesses to Bendigo. So obviously with connectivity, you know, that's one of the key questions that businesses will ask and do ask. And so how do we get businesses to actually locate here? And it's about having a really uh, livable city so people get that balance of lifestyle and business. And so economic development issues, I think, are around growing some of those opportunities. And when you look at the new hospital, you know, you look at the growth that's going to happen there, people that are moving here and so on, we need those jobs to come forward so that people will move back to Bendigo or mm. come here because uh, it's a new lifestyle choice for them. Well, so. we've talked a lot about that here as well with a number of people. The fact that uh, it's all very well for young people to take their skills off to Melbourne and Cap Cities, as I've suggested they do. Mm. but as you've suggested too, in a connectivity sense globally, there's no reason why a lot of those jobs can't be done from a remote location now. But the underlying reality for me is with a couple of kids in Melbourne, and I know a lot of people in this situation, I know two kids, that, not two kids, they're 30s, that are going to head back from Melbourne to Shepparton in the next six to 12 months. And I know two that are seriously looking to come back to Benigo, simply because having reached you know, a, a really good level in their career, they are not able to afford to buy a home down there and they know damn well they're not going to be able to. Do you think council could be doing more, like even a marketing campaign or something? Yeah, look, certainly I think that that's um, something that we should be starting to push even more. And I, I, like the manufacturing uh, industry, although it's quite small in Bendigo, we're actually seen as one of the leaders in that particularly in Victoria. We've got a manufacturing hub that's doing some fantastic things. And Keach, you know, with their 3D printing, yep. you know, they're doing work all over Australia and globally as well. Uh, so there's industry that are starting to lead the way uh, and have done, and that will attract other people to come back to Bendigo. Council's been in the news uh, for a, a lot of the wrong reasons too, through this term of council. Um, and I'm talking about, um, you know, they're all, well, I won't go into the particular issues because they're well documented and they have been locally. Mm. But what that's done is put the spotlight on governance. And we've had a couple of council candidates, uh, Brenton Johnson's one talking about, um, and Yvonne Rigglesworth as well, talking about the need for governance and to run it more like a business. Now, Ted Coleman is a you know, social commentator here and he hates being called the social commentator, Ted, but a wonderful bloke. Um, very passionate. And I said to him last time he was in, last week, I think, I always saw council as the board of directors, if you like, instructing council executive staff and staff generally as to how to, what vision needs to be implemented. Is that how you would see it? Or, or is, there, is there a difference of application for you in terms oh, of... Oh, no, look, I do see that quite similar, Dennis. And because of my experience, I've been the company director now for, what, 14 years. Um, I do see very much that, that there is an element of that. So councillors are there to set the strategy, the council plan. Uh, and at the end of the day, the council's um, working relationship is with the CEO. So they employ the CEO, the CEO employs the staff. Uh, and it, and it's, that's no different to other, other boards. So in terms of, um, you know, each board obviously has a different governance model, but the ones that I certainly am involved in, there is a relationship with the board and the executive team 
Uh, they are the people that are paid to do the work, the officers. And so when uh, the direction is set by the councillors, um, it, they will put the work together, obviously, and they will bring that to the board. Now, the, the board or the councillors have the opportunity to read those documents, and if they feel that they're not quite answering the questions that they want, they go and ask more questions. And that certainly is a way in which um, a board does operate uh, in that regard. So they go deeper and ask further questions if they feel that that's not being uh, answered or is responsive for them. But in terms of the actual doing of the work, um, day to day, it is the executive team in any organisation that does that and they then collate that and bring that forward. But the council will set that direction. There's been, well, Ted was quite uh, forthcoming in fact and uh, I think we probably both got a surprise in a way during the interview when uh, the point made was that we've had some current councillors suggest that uh, we needed fresh blood, you always need fresh blood and fresh ideas on council. And Ted's response to that was, I don't know whether you've seen the interview, but his response was, well, maybe there's some of them who should move aside and create some room for that fresh blood. Um, that led to a discussion then of maybe a split term. So you have end up with a council made up of some experienced councillors who know the, the, the governance areas better and have a working relationship already with the CEO and so on and executive staff, but a fresh group of people, young people coming in and almost being mentored as councillors. Yeah. What would you think of something like that? Or do you think there's not an issue there anyway? Oh, it... look, I, I think um, regeneration's really good anyway. And if you look at a, in a sense of a governance of a board of directors, there are terms. Mm. So not everyone goes off at the one time and there are one, two and three year terms. So, you know, there is that, um, um, you know, the approach. Continuity. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've got some um, strength in terms of people that have been there for a while and then you bring new people in. And it does take people a while to actually understand the operation of an organisation. Mm. Um, and one of the failings I think that happens with board directors, particularly in the early days, is they are too operational and that is not their role. Mm. And so if I look at local government, Dennis, Victoria's got a model that is that the, the councils are part time. You know, they're certainly most of them not there mm. for the money, as you know, but mm. there is a huge amount of work that needs to be done. Queensland have a different model. They actually have full time councillors. Yeah. So they've gone to that model. That isn't our model in Victoria. And our model Should in Victoria. Um, look, you know, it's always open to discussion mm. and uh, I know a number of people who are councillors in Queensland and I think it brings a different level of person to the table mm. because it is seen more as a, as a job and so um, because they are in, in there, they probably get into the doing too much. So mm. finding that balance, you know, really, you have to raise the, the um, intellect around the table so that it is about driving the strategy. What is it that we want? Whereas if you are full time, I think there's a tendency that you will end up going down into the areas that are staff and officer level and so yeah. on. Margot, uh, final question, I guess. Uh, I look at the Epilock Ward, I wonder why so many people, I mean, it's like the Melbourne Cup field in terms of numbers out there and a bit of quality too, but so many people with an interest. Why do you think it is? Is, is it because of the growth uh, of areas like Strathfield, say, and even uh, Junit to a point? But I, I don't get why, the, you know, you've gone into it, you're in a tough Yeah, right absolutely. I mean, f simply for me, it's where I live. Mm. And I know there's no rules around that you actually have to stand in an area that's where you live. But for me, I've always, I've grown up in that area. You know, East Bendigo was my, where I grew up as mm. a kid. Um, when I went away and came back, we moved into Strathdale and now we're at Juniton. I've always lived on that side of town. Yeah. So I found it really hard that I would um, nominate into another into another ward. Uh, look, I think this time round, people uh, want choice. And I think there's a lot of people that have decided to say, well, I think I've got something to offer and, and I'm going to stand. And I think that's fabulous. Mm. You know, like I think that the opportunity for people to put their hand up um, is great. And, you know, the outcome will be the outcome. Um, you would remember this. Part of another reason why I decided to stand is growing up here in the 70s mm. uh, and the 80s. I was working I'm in not the that 80s. Old. No, <laughs> um, the business people who were the leaders of business at that time were the councillors. Mm. Um, if you Absolutely. remember, they were people that were um, 
although busy people, mm. they were the ones that put their hand up and, and um, wanted to make that contribution. And I'm at a stage and an age in my life where I feel I can give back with the experience that I've learned over the years with the various roles I've had with Telstra. I'm working in my own business. We've got our own small business in Strath Village. Ray's got a cleaning business. Uh, and it's really different corporate life to mm. small business. Let me tell you, even though you're um, consulting with, with small business when you're in a large corporate not until you're on the ground Absolutely. in it. Uh, I've probably worked harder in these last five years than I have for a long time. But it's it's about um, making sure that people's voices get heard and it's actually having responsive and effective local government. And I think the last four years we've lost that. So I, I sort of hark back to those days where those business leaders really were the people that, uh, that put their hand up and I think we need more of that. Mm. Marg, hopefully, well, not hopefully, I know there will be issues that will uh, bubble to the surface between now and those mm -hmm. council elections, uh, and we've made ourselves available to all people who've put their hand up for council. Love to think that this is only the first of a number of get-togethers where we can gather, gather your views on those issues as they come to the fore, and all in the hope that people are better advised and better informed as to how prospective councillors might tackle particular issues or what vision they might bring to the table. So uh, thanks a million for taking the time today. Good luck with the campaign. Thank you, Dennis. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll look forward to catching up with you again down the track. Yeah, look forward to it. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for joining us today and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week.